The topic for discussion is alveolar bone. We all know that periodontium contains two soft tissue components and two hard tissue components. One of the hard tissue components is alveolar bone. So this alveolar bone forms an osseous attachment to the periodontal ligament. You can see that the periodontal ligament fibers are extending from the cementum to the alveolar bone. So the osseous attachment to the periodontal ligament is formed when the tooth is erupting. And always remember that the alveolar bone is a tooth dependent bony structure. The size, shape, location and function of the teeth will determine the morphology of the alveolar bone. So when the tooth is lost, the alveolar bone is not present. So it disappears gradually after the tooth is lost and it's a tooth dependent bony structure. Always remember that slight repositioning of the tooth by occlusal forces or because of the orthodontic forces will rely on the adaptability of the alveolar bone. So any change in the teeth will also affect the change of the alveolar bone. The alveolar process consists of outer plate of the cortical bone whereas the inner socket wall is formed by thin compact bone. If you examine radiographically this thin compact bone which is called as alveolar bone proper is seen as lamina dura in the radiographs whereas histologically it appears as a series of openings. Through these series of openings there will be neurovascular bundles that will be linking the periodontal ligament to the alveolar bone. So this series of openings is called as cribriform plate and there will be cancellous trabeculae in between these two layers in between the cortical bone and in between the compact bone there will be cancellous trabeculae. The interdental septum is formed by this cancellous trabeculae. And in the picture you can appreciate a part called as basal bone. So this basal bone is present in the apical portion of the jaw and this is not related to the teeth. Okay, so this is the portion of the jaw that is located apically and is unrelated to the teeth. The next picture shows the relative proportions of the cancellous bone and the compact bone. So this is taken in the facial lingual section that is a longitudinal facial lingual section. You can appreciate the proportions of the compact bone and the cancellous bone present. So here you can see that most of the facial and lingual portions of the socket are formed by the compact bone. Okay, whereas the cancellous bone will be surrounding the lamina dura. In the next picture you can see the shapes of the roots and the surrounding bone distribution right in the transverse section of the maxilla and mandible. So there are tooth root sockets which are surrounded by the bone. So you can appreciate the bone distribution around each tooth right. Next we will see the composition of the alveolar bone. It is two thirds made up of inorganic matter whereas one third is made up of organic matter. The inorganic matter includes the calcium, phosphate, sodium, magnesium, fluorine and hydroxyapatite crystals whereas the organic matrix is made up of 90% type 1 collagen and there are also non-collagenous proteins which include the osteocalcin, osteonectin, bone morphogenic proteins that is BMP, phosphoproteins and proteoglycans. Now we will see about bone remodeling. So although this alveolar bone is constantly changing throughout the life, it's changing its internal organization, but it will retain its same form from the childhood throughout the adult life. So this is because this maintenance is because of the balance in between bone resorption and bone formation. There will be an equilibrium in between bone resorption and bone formation and this equilibrium is maintained by local factors and the systemic factors. If there is any imbalance in between the bone resorption and bone formation then there will be changes in the morphology of the alveolar bone. If suppose the bone resorption is greater when compared to bone formation then both the bone height and density will decrease. And then if suppose the resorption is less when compared to bone formation or the bone formation is greater then what happens obviously the height and density of the alveolar bone will be increasing. Remodeling is a major pathway of bony changes in shape, resistance to forces, repair of wounds and calcium and phosphate homeostasis in the body. So there is coupling of the bone resorption and bone formation which is the fundamental principle by which the bone is remodeled throughout the life. So when there is bone resorption there will be bone formation. So because of this balance in between bone resorption and bone formation there will be maintenance of the alveolar bone form. This is the fundamental principle right. So there is balance in between the bone resorption and bone formation. This balance is regulated by local factors as well as the systemic factors. Osteoblasts are the bone forming cells whereas osteoclasts are the bone resorbing cells. So you can see in the picture the bone remodeling cycle in which 
there is resting bone surface onto which the pre osteoclasts are getting converted into active osteoclasts and they are resorbing the bone so after the resorption the osteoblasts which are the bone forming cells are coming into the resorptive site and they are depositing bone so there is always a balance in between bone resorption and bone formation so the remodeling is maintained by two important lineages of cells the first one is osteoclasts and next one is the osteoclasts so because of these two cells there is balance if suppose these osteoblasts are depositing more amount of bone in the active resorption site in such cases it is called as buttressing bone formation all these variations in the bone patterns will be discussed in bone loss and patterns of bone destruction but for now remember that there is balance in between bone resorption and bone formation and this balance is maintained by local factors and systemic factors next we will see what periosteum and what endosteum is the tissue that is covering the outer surface of the bone is called as periosteum whereas the tissue lining the internal bone cavities is called as endosteum here you can appreciate in the picture the periosteum which is the outer covering of the bone whereas in the second picture you can notice the endosteum which is covering the internal cavity of the bone i want you all to understand some variations in the normal pattern here i will be discussing only about two variations here that is a boneless window and fenestration and dehiscence remaining will be discussed in the bone loss and patterns of bone destruction topic so here boneless window is formed when the two teeth are closely approximated to each other you can see in the picture that if the two teeth are closely approximated to each other there will be loss of bone on the proximal surfaces this condition is called as boneless window and the second one you can see is about the fenestration and dehiscence so the isolated areas in which the root is denuded of bone is called as fenestration so you can see that the first premolar is having an isolated area of denuded bone right and if there is denuded bone isolated areas of denuded bone and the root surface is covered only by periosteum and the overlying gingiva this condition is called as fenestration whereas in the canine you can see an extension of the bone loss right that is not isolated so in such cases this condition is called as dehiscence so in dehiscence the denuded areas are extending through the marginal bone whereas in fenestration these areas are isolated okay so fenestration is seen on the first premolar here whereas canine is showing the dehiscence defect by this we can understand that if there is any change in the teeth alignment if suppose the tooth is located more labially in such cases there will be resorption of the alveolar bone there will be loss of the bone if the tooth alignment is different then also be there will be changes in the patterns of the alveolar bone see if the root roots are approximated to each other then there is loss of bone and that condition is called as window so this morphology of the alveolar bone is dependent on many factors like root anatomy root trunk anatomy approximation of the two root surfaces teeth position and a lot of factors so all these factors will determine the morphology of the alveolar bone and therefore the alveolar bone is called as a tooth dependent structure so here we come to the conclusion of the topic the alveolar process will develop and undergo remodeling with tooth formation and eruption the coupling of bone resorption and bone formation constitutes one of the fundamental principle by which the bone is remodeled through its life let's summarize this topic now we have seen that the alveolar bone is surrounding the tooth sockets and it is a tooth dependent structure we have seen what alveolar process is made up of the outer cortical bone inner plate of compact bone and in between these two there is cancellous trabeculae we have seen that bone remodeling is very important and this bone remodeling is regulated by two lineages of cells one is the osteoclast and the second one is the osteoblast so next we have seen about the boneless window and the fenestration and dehiscence and we have also learned about the periosteum and endosteum layers one is the outer covering of the bone whereas the other one is the inner covering of the bone in this topic from mcq point of view you need to be thorough with the fenestration and dehiscence periosteum and endosteum terminologies and the composition of the alveolar bone in which there are a certain proteins called as non collagenous proteins you need to be thorough with these non collagenous proteins thank you everyone for your patient listening and all the best